Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Assalatu wassalamu ala rasulayil kareem. Uh, thanks everyone for, for coming today. So uh, my name is Dr. Aman Siddiqui. Uh, we've recently started an advocacy and civic engagement committee at PGMA. So the committee's purpose is to uh, help the community get involved in advocacy, activism, important issues that are affecting the Muslims, and also civic engagement means voting, understanding more about government, uh, politicians, things like that. So tonight we have a great program, uh, CARE, which is the uh, uh, Council on American Islamic Relations, does all kinds of research about uh, what the politicians uh, vote on. You know, we don't know what they're voting on, right? It finds out what their opinions are about issues that affect Muslims. It gives them surveys. Uh, and it also gives us report cards about how they vote. They do all kinds of terrific things. And another thing they did um, is they did an exit poll after the recent primary election. So inshallah, uh, we have Sister uh, Samya, uh, who's, gonna jo who's joining us tonight. She is a physician here in PG County. She's also one of the co-founders of Iman, which is the Islamic Maryland Action Network. So it's basically a group of all the Muslim masajids and other organizations in Maryland who come together for the purpose of political activism, motivating the Muslim community, things like that. Uh, and she's also on the CARE Action Advisory Board. Care Action is a, a, a division of care that is more directly involved in politics and electing people. So she's a terrific resource. She's going to go through with us two things. One will be the um, results of that exit poll and how it was created to find out how Muslims are voting. Does the Muslim vote matter? Do we have an impact? And then also she's going to talk about Care Action, which is a new thing which they're going to uh, uh, give advice about who to vote for, who are their endorsements. Because you go to the pallet and you don't know who, is, who does what. People usually just vote for whoever's already in office. And you don't know. Uh, they're very good at telling you that they support Muslim values, but then in reality, their votes aren't that way. So care action is a great resource everyone has to start learning about. It's brand new, but she's going to explain how they will start making endorsements. So in the future, you'll be able to go to care action website and say, who do they endorse for president? Who do they endorse for Senate? Who should I vote in my local election? Things like that. Um, and then after that, I have a short presentation as well on uh, uh, should Muslims vote? Um, is it halal? Is it haram? Things like that. So I'm going to pass it over to Sister Samya. Assalamu alaikum, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First, I want to thank uh, PGMA for organizing this. Um, hopefully my mic is okay, and Brother Aman for having me here. So I'm going to be representing um, CARE, the C3, and also CARE Actions, the C4, both organizations, um, to review this information with you tonight, inshallah. So first, we were going, what, what we will be doing is going over the Maryland primary elections and the, the process the C3 CARE undertook um, in creating a candidate survey. So the goal of the candidate survey was to have a resource for the community for public education to help everyone in the community be able to make informed decisions by providing insights into the candidates' positions on key issues that impact our community specifically. So there were 10 questions that were sent to all candidates running from both sides of the aisle. And these questions address foreign policy, religious freedom, Islamophobia and education, immigration. And every effort was made by CARE uh, to make sure that we were being inclusive, that every candidate, whether it was from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, anyone that was running had the opportunity to get these questions from CARE. Can candidates, were candid uh, candidates were contacted via email and phone and they were given about three to four weeks enough time to be able to respond. One of the first and main questions that CARE felt that was very important to ask every candidate running in every position was their view on ceasefire, permanent ceasefire in Gaza. After we were able to collect that data, their questionnaire was released to the community. Um, and then once the primary happened, CARE also did an exit poll uh, where we had a sampling of 407 Maryland Muslim residents who took the poll after uh, they voted on the primary. This was a sampling of Maryland Muslim voters' views and priorities. 
Um, and the results were based on this electronic survey. Anyone who responded who did not completely fill out the survey, uh, this data was removed uh, because it was incomplete. The majority of respondents prioritized foreign policy issues, including Palestine at the polls being the most important thing for them when they voted this primary season. 95.9% .9 of the respondents who voted in the Democratic Party voted uncommitted for president. And this is a very important thing to highlight because this is probably the uh, first election and primary in Maryland where the Muslim community really rallied and organized around uncommitted. Um, usually uncommitted does not get as much of a vote in Maryland in the primaries. Um, so historically has not. So this was a, definitely a protest vote. And it was an important way for Maryland Muslims and allies to be able to say they were unhappy with the foreign policies of the current administration. What we also found was that 91.9% uh, .9 of the registered, voter, registered voters who responded also did actually vote. You know, we CARE did a lot of advocacy trying to get the community out to register, but there's no point in registering if you're not gonna vote. So the goal is to register and also to finally vote. 91.7% of the, those who responded to the survey voted, at, uh, voted in the Democratic primary. Um, so if you can see the party affiliation, 91.7% voted Democratic, 3.2% was Republican, and 5.1% was unaffiliated. Something to point out, what was really important about this primary season was those people, individuals and voters who wanted to vote uncommitted, they had to vote affiliated with the Democratic Party as this option was only present on the Democratic ballot, which likely uh, got a lot of people to a register as a Democrat for the primary. Now, when you register as a Democrat for the primary, that does not mean you have to vote in the general election as a Democrat. You can vote for whoever you want. But the ballot to be able to vote and committed, you have to be registered as a Democrat. Um, if we look at the percentage for uh, uncommitted, 95.9%, .9 as I said, was uh, for uncommitted. So that was 329 of the 407 people that uh, filled out our survey here. When we dig a little deeper to kind of see what were the issues that were on the minds of Maryland Muslims this primary season, as you can see, foreign policy hit really high. And we obviously understand that the foreign policy likely relates to what's happening in Gaza, but also, and not limited to Kashmir, Sudan, uh, what's happening in the Uyghurs, and also in India. The second most important issue on people's mind was Islamophobia and all of the incidents of hate bias and bullying that we've seen this past year of uh, fellow Muslims who have tried to be active in any way, um, students who were active in supporting the poor Palestinian cause, there was a lot of hate bias and bullying that happened. So this was definitely an important issue for Maryland Muslims. Another important race, and wasn't just the, a lot of times when we think about elections, everyone thinks about the presidential race being really important, but Maryland has an open US Senate seat. So another really important race this primary season was the US Senate candidate. Um, and as we can see for the Democratic candidate, Angela also Brooks received 89.2% of Maryland Muslim votes uh, versus David Trone, who received 4.4%, which is a very small amount. Um, in the Republican side, we only had about 12 Muslims who voted on that side, and Larry Hogan did get the majority of that. What I wanna point out about the Democratic Senate race is that the actual number of votes that led also Brooks to beat David Trone was maybe around 40 to 50,000 votes. So it wasn't a huge, huge margin. And if we look deeper, we can see that the uncommitted ballots that came in around that um, was around the same percentage of votes, number of votes, excuse me. So it was around 40 to 50,000 votes. And from that, what we can understand is the number of voters turning out to support uncommitted also swayed the election towards Angela also Brooks, which was a very close election. So it just tells us how important each and every vote happens to be because it can really turn an election upside down. Now in our uh, exit poll that we have from CARE here, what we learned also was in our sampling, 88.7% of the people who responded do plan on voting in the general election. 
and about 1.2% said no, and about 10% said they were unsure. This is important because we actually do need Muslims to go out and vote in the general election, and we'll discuss why. A lot of times we sometimes feel hopeless, like what is the point of us voting? Nothing really changes. Why should we even vote when there's really no difference sometimes between candidates? Our vote does matter even if we don't feel like it does. It's a powerful tool that can influence the direction of US policy, domestic and foreign, including decisions around military aid and humanitarian assistance in conflict zones. Participating in the democratic process allows you to hold your elected officials accountable and advocate for peace, justice, and human rights. And what we saw with the uncommitted movement was just that. We did not have a great choice for the democratic nominee during the primary season. But still, voting did send a message. Even though we chose not to vote for a candidate, many people chose to vote for uncommitted, they were able to send a message of how they were displeased with the current state of affairs. So that's why voting in this you know, protest vote was so important in a symbolic way. We know that when we vote, we're bringing light to the genocide in Gaza, settler colonial violence of the West Bank, the rise of fascism in India, uh, oppression of the Uyghurs, Kashmiris, combined with increasing censorship of Palestine advocates and surge of Islamophobia here at home. Um, we cannot afford to not vote when these issues are so important and so pressing, and we cannot afford to be disengaged because we want to highlight these issues with every election cycle and to remind our elected officials that our vote is important, is necessary for them to win our, our vote and to um, prioritize the issues we care deeply about. When we vote, we are also, when we choose not to vote, we're going to be jeopardizing our community's safety and well-being. So making our voices heard in this election, we can support candidates who stand firmly against hate and develop policies that protect the rights and dignity of our communities. So your vote has the potential to drive change and shape the future of global and local communities. So when we talk about the primary, CARE, the C3 portion, what the organization did was release to the community questionnaires that the candidates filled out. And the most important thing we wanted to highlight for the community, which we knew the community cared about, was their response to questions regarding ceasefire. So if you looked at the 2024 Congressional Voter Guide survey questions, one of the first ones was for the ceasefire was, do you support or oppose calls for an immediate US-backed ceasefire? And candidates had to just say yes or no. And this was very telling because it helped discriminate between candidates who felt uncomfortable, didn't want to be public, didn't feel comfortable answering the question, and those that did. Um, and the results from the exit poll is helpful to us because it shows us that the amount of advocacy that went out to uh, tell people to go out to vote did make a difference because we were able to get a great number of Muslim Mar Maryland Muslim community to go out and vote. Now, the C4 portion, Care Action, is a new entity that started this past, uh, this past spring or early spring, is a C4, which is different than a C3, meaning there is political advocacy that Care Action can do that Care C3 cannot do. And we have to separate the two, which can be confusing to people. What C4 Care Action did was they have an advisory board and they looked at the answers from the C3's candidate questionnaire. Then they dug a little deeper and they learned more about these races and these candidates and looked at their overall profile. And they also discussed with their um, community, with the community leaders um, and stakeholders. They looked at the financial di disclosures analysis and each campaign's ground game and strategy. And they also have their own board of advisors in care action when it comes to endorsements. With the Shura of many, they were able to create um, a voter guide to tell Maryland Muslims for many of the races who would be the best candidate in that race. And for races where we couldn't, where they couldn't pick someone, it was just left empty. This was then distributed 
throughout uh, our communities to help uh, Maryland Muslims make a decision on voting uh, for the candidate they felt uh, best represented them. Now, with the general election coming, I would say that this, like any other election, will always be an important election. And if you feel that you, if you don't vote, then you're somehow removing yourself from the process, what we end up doing when we don't vote is we go unseen and unheard. And that's our biggest concern. So it's not so much about who you're voting for, but just not having the data of you voting makes it seem like our community does not exist here in Maryland. And that's what we want to make sure that our politicians understand that we are a large community, that we are an important community, and one that should not be overlooked. So if you do not vote, you technically make it seem as if Muslims don't exist in Maryland. And I think the biggest thing and the biggest takeaway from this is, no matter what, voting in November, at least if we come together in some sort of unit, and it can't always be 100%, but if we have a united voice and we do vote as a voter block and eventually get there as a voter block, then we will be looked as a community that politicians will want to come and seek to understand what will get our votes. So then our issues and our concerns become their priorities. That's how elections work. If you don't vote, you can't complain. You have no choice, you have no uh, voice. And, and it doesn't matter for politicians, you don't exist. So they're not gonna care about your issues. They're not gonna care about your concerns, your principles, your values, because for them, you are not a voting member of the community. If you vote and you consistently vote, and as, as we grow together and understand this process better as a community, and we start voting in a block where the Muslim voice is being heard, this will in future <clears throat> generations have a great impact on policies locally and also nationally. I'll pass this over to Brother Am. Bismillah Thank you very much. Wow, that was really fantastic. I really, really appreciate Sister Samia going through all that information. I know it was a lot of information, just the basic summary is that these elections have thin margins. People win by small amounts. Because I can't tell you how many times I've been told the Muslim vote doesn't matter. We're 1% of the population. Who cares? They don't realize how many of the elections are won by 1%, 2%, half percent. Uh, I live in a small micro city called Seat Pleasant within the PG County. You know, our elections in my little city are one in the hundreds. Literally, 500 people vote, and the mayor won by 39 votes. I mean, uh, elections aren't about millions of people all the time. So the, the statistics she gave us, really fantastic, when she was highlighting the thin margin that our senator, uh, our, our potential Senate candidate won by. Um, and uh, if you're interested to get all this great care information, they have what's called the Congressional Scorecard, where they tell us how all the Congress people voted. They have these questionnaires that they give them ahead of time. All this data, right? So we have started a PGMA advocacy WhatsApp group. I know there's a million WhatsApp groups at PGMA, but if you wanna get easy access, inshallah, we'll try to post all those things because it's hard to find everything from all different places. We don't post very much. So if you join that, you could find out, is there a demonstration going on in DC? Uh, is there an action alert I can sign my name? Uh, is CARE distributing some information? So it's an easy way to get those kind of things. So since we have some time left, uh, another thing I just want to go through is a lot, a lot, a lot of people <laughs> apparently across the nation have been told it's haram to vote. It may not be your beliefs, but probably you've heard this. Uh, and it's so prevalent that Sheikh Yasser Qadi recently released a video just on this topic, specifically because of the importance of the current elections, the issues in Gaza, Sudan, etc. He wanted to address this. And so I just wanted to summarize that video for all of us. Uh, obviously, I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I'm just telling you what he said, and clearly he is a very advanced Islamic scholar. Uh, I encourage anyone to watch the full video if they would like. You could just Google, should Muslims vote in YouTube, and his video will come right up. And even if you already believe in voting, you think, I don't believe that, right? Probably you have friends who do, relatives who do. Each one of you is a member of your community, right? You didn't come here alone. Everyone here is in their, their uh, community of their culture, of their country, of their neighborhood. So you can learn this information. You can dispel any myths. You can share with them 
uh, uh, these ideas because you can really make a big impact. If you change the mind of 10 people, then you get some hasana for your vote, you get hasana for their votes and for the people they tell, etc. So we'll just, I wanna quickly go through, he hits all the main issues that people say, the, the myths. So first of all, he starts with talking about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which comes up a lot when people are talking about politics, but he makes some very specific, uh, draws some specific lessons for it uh, relative to this issue. So first of all, he points out that in the situation of Hudaybiyah where the Muslims in Medina, they were, they were coming to Mecca, they wanted to make Umrah and they were denied. So he said, first of all, the Quraysh broke their own laws. They broke their own laws because they already had a rule that anyone can do Umrah in the sacred months. It doesn't matter if you're an enemy of Quraysh. It doesn't matter if you're wanted for a crime. Those were the rules. So they were already being hypocrites. Uh, so already the Muslims were being treated unjustly. Second was the treaty, I'm sure most of us have heard this, the treaty appeared at the time to be very unjust against the Muslims. Uh, there was of course the refusal to refer to Rasulullah as the messenger of Allah. There was also the preventing them from Umrah that year, which as I just said was what we want to call illegal. Breaking, you know, does it sound familiar? A country breaking its own laws. Um, <clears throat> And they weren't denied when they were in Medina. They traveled all the way there. They get there and they say, go back with no rights. There's no court that said that. They just do what they want to do. And last was, of course, most people know this. The Meccans who want to become Muslim will be turned away. But anyone who wants to leave Medina and go back to the Kufar, they're accepted. Completely unjust, right? In fact, there was, I didn't know this. I learned this from the video. There was a Sahabi who was still in Mecca. And in that very moment, he had escaped to join the Medinan congregation. And the Meccans said, the treaty starts today, send him back. And the Rasulullah was arguing, trying to get him to stay, trying to get him to stay. And he said, we, this treaty starts now if you want it to be signed. The poor Sahabi had to be sent back. Imagine how they all felt. So he's trying to put us in the mindset of uh, this treaty being signed with such a list of injustices, double standards, unjust, does it sound familiar? Yet this treaty is referred to as Fatha Mubina in the Quran, a, a, a big victory. So Sheikh Yasir Qadi gave several takeaways. And these are the ones he's saying are specific to voting when you're in America or you're in a non-Muslim area. A, ideal situations are rarely achieved. These are his exact words. Ideal situations are rarely achieved and pragmatic compromise is part of the sunnah. That's point one. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said he would agree to any condition in that treaty, even if it involves humiliation to the Muslims, which of course there was, as long as the due respect to Allah and the honor to Allah was preserved. So there was a limit, but it was reserved for things for Allah. The Muslims being treated poorly, he said, we will, we will take that abuse because it's a kind of feasibility. Second point, he said, short-term compromises are okay when, specifically when, it is specifically supporting a, a long-term goal. So it's not like I'm just compromising on my religion. There is a long-term goal. We all know the goal of Treaty of Hudaybiyah is that Islam spread by wildfire. And it's easy to look at it from the past, hindsight is 2020. Nobody thinks that that could be happening now or something like that. Uh, so basically the treaty, it seemed very unfair, but it was a strategic compromise. This is, this is his takeaways from it. So Sheikh Yasser Qadi, he uh, identified three myths or misconceptions about voting that he wants to clarify that are very common. Literally, I've been told them, Dara Taqwa also has an advocacy committee and the person running it, he has been told it. I believe Sister Samia told me she has been told this. These are very common. So common that Yasser Qadi is making a video about it. A, <clears throat> voting is not an endorsement of everything the government does. There's this idea that if I vote, it means I'm supporting the government, so I should abstain. He very clearly said that's not true, that's false. He said, this is his words, he said there's a consensus among the Islamic scholars that participation in the government of any country you live in is necessary and that choosing the lesser of evils is a valid Islamic approach. 
He said, this is a complete consensus. Uh, he said, you know, when people sometimes give a different point of view, they're usually like a local imam or someone like this. You know, he's a very advanced level person and he talks to the advanced level people. He said he's never met one of these very educated scholars who has disagreed with this. Um, <clears throat> you're not agreeing with everything the government does just by participating. In fact, every American knows this. Every American disagrees with half the things the government does. And in your home countries, it was the same way, right? Participating is not an endorsement of anything. Uh, but for some reason, that idea became prevalent here. Two, a very similar idea, but maybe more specific. This is probably the most important point of the whole talk. Voting for a specific candidate is not an endorsement of every single issue they stand for. I'm gonna repeat that. That's literally, if you remember nothing else, just remember this. Voting for someone does not mean I agree with everything they said. That's true across the board for any candidate, for any position of any, any organization. Every voter has, these are his words, three or four issues that they prioritize. And they measure each candidate on those three or four. They will, no person will find a candidate who agrees with 100% of things they think. And now, Yasser Qadi said this specifically. He said, issues of aqidah are lower priority than issues of policy. For who? For a politician. He said this like 20 times in the video. He said the politicians are not the one giving you fatwa. They are not the ulama. We are not getting all of our lessons of aqidah from them. We're not evaluating did they pray their salah. They are not our ultimate ideal uh, representatives. They are there to do a specific job. And so measuring what their opinions are on the things that are relevant to their position is the most important. And this is also true among just all voters. I mean, not every Democrat agrees with 100% of the things that Joe Biden might say. There might be a pro-life Democrat, and he still votes for Joe Biden because he's a Democrat. So very important point that Yasser Qadi was emphasizing. You can criticize some of the positions that a candidate holds. That's fine, that's good, you should do that. But you can still vote for them if they are the best policy maker for the Muslims. Because the number one thing I hear, I've been told it right in this musalla, is I can't vote for that Muslim candidate because they said X, Y, or Z. They want them to be a mullah or a sheikh and have everything perfect. And I asked them, is it even that way in your home country? There was 100% Muslim? And they say, no. Even in a home country, they're not good Muslims. But they're expecting the person here to be, I don't know what. So here's an example, and this is his example he gave, but it's probably the most common thing I'm told, so he's obviously been told it. Most, or maybe all of the Muslims in the Congress support LGBTQ rights. You're not gonna get elected on a Democratic ticket unless you have that somewhere. Does that mean I shouldn't vote for them? Do you, th this is what he said, Yasser Qadi's response. Do you think the Zionist opponent trying to replace the Muslim candidate is somehow gonna be a better option? He is also going to endorse whatever un-Islamic principle that person said, like LGBTQ, plus a hundred other horrible things. In fact, he said, why do we stop at LGBTQ? Why don't you demand that every candidate support banning alcohol? I mean, no one in America is going to say that, right? So we pick and choose every, any random thing we can find about the candidate to criticize them and then abstain from voting. And he said, this is his words, he said, this is totally wrong. He said, they have a specific job. The congressperson doesn't, in, doesn't promote or condone LGBTQ anyways. I mean, that's not their job, right? That's more of a moral thing. They're not involved in your personal life. So they put that there just for you know, uh, publicity, but they have no impact. They don't make any rules about that. What they make rules about is foreign policy, taxes, how uh, Muslims are treated in the United States, hate crimes, all the important things. That's, he's saying, that's what you should measure them on. Because I've been told so many times, yeah, yeah, those Muslims are great, but, but they did this, but they did. I don't know who they're waiting for. So he said very clearly, he said, don't be an extremist who will not vote for anyone unless they're better than the best imam. So he gave a terrific example. 
He said, it's, it's slightly different, but just to get the point across, he said there was a Shia masjid that was attacked and vandalized somewhere. And the people were asking him this personally. So this is a firsthand story. They were vandalized by some right, far right wing group. And they, the Shia Muslims went to the city hall to protest. And the Sunni masjid said, are we allowed to join them? They asked Sheikh Yasser Qadi, can we join them in the protest? And he said, do you think the far right people attacked them specifically because they're Shia? They said, of course not. They don't know. They just attacked because they were Muslim. They said, then you should be joining your Muslim brothers. By joining them in the protest, you are not somehow endorsing them being Shia. It's an irrelevant factor. But, I'm, but most people were saying, we can't join them in the protest. So he said, you should definitely join them. You are protesting the attack of a masjid. It has nothing to do with your differences of Aqidah. This is his uh, ruling. And the third thing, the last thing, is another common thing, is it's better not to vote than, for example, to vote for a third party. Uh, you know, every country on the planet probably has more than two parties but us. And they keep telling us over and over, if you vote for a third party, your vote is wasted. So I'm confused. How is not voting at all not wasting your vote? But voting for a third party is wasting. It makes no sense at all. So uh, uh, first of all, Allah will make win the election whoever he wants. If he wants there to be a huge uh, uh, amount of endorsement for a third party because of Gaza and there's a miracle and the third party wins, it will happen. It, it, the idea of it's not practical doesn't make any sense. This is like someone saying, why are you going to endorse this Traitor who is trying to, uh, I mean, traitor uh, businessman who is trying to overthrow the Quraysh. He can never overthrow the Quraysh. Don't be foolish. If you don't like Abu Sufyan, endorse someone else. Endorse Abu Jahl. Don't be stupid and endorse this random businessman. He can never overthrow the Quraysh. This is not the mindset of a Muslim. So first of all, in general, we should never say uh, uh, that my vote uh, or, or some event cannot happen. But more importantly, uh, this idea of wasting a vote is a way to control your vote. So these are the three main things that he was addressing. One was, voting is not an endorsement of the government. Two, voting for a specific person who is good for the Muslims is not an endorsement of every single thing they say. And third, voting for a third party or for anyone you want is written in your account. It's not like, oh, I have to give my vote to someone uh, from some political strategy. Voting for your conscience is an Islamic idea. Okay, I'm almost finished. Uh, last thing he mentioned, very important. He said the responsibilities of the American Muslims are unique. Our community is the most powerful Muslim community on the face of this earth. Why is that? How can that be? We're such a small percentage. Because we live in the very country that is funding these issues. If you live in India, your vote only affects India. If you live in Brazil, your vote affects only Brazil. If you live in Russia, it's only going to affect Russia. Your vote in America affects every country on earth because America, as we know, is involved in everything on the earth. He said we have a specific responsibility. A lot of the people in our community left their home country because they said they didn't have a voice. My family's from Pakistan, my wife's from Pakistan. In Pakistan, they know your taxes are going in someone's pocket, your vote is meaningless, they'll make this project and they will not fit it. Well, you're not there anymore. You're here now. So you not only have a voice, you have a most important voice. So it's a responsibility, it's a hub. So that was a really important point he made. He said it's not just an option. He gave a great example. He said the Prime Minister of Scotland the new Prime Minister of Scotland is Muslim. I don't know if he still is, at some point he was. He said the very first tweet he made was him leading Tarawi prayer, if you can imagine. The election was in Ramadan, and his wife is Palestinian. And when the war started, he was tweeting like crazy about the war. Obviously in favor of ceasefire and everything like this. He said a lot of the Muslims were making takfir against him because he also had some pro-LGBTQ comments somewhere. So the question is, you have to ask yourself, do you want someone in Congress? But, but why was he put there? 
He was put in the, in the parliament to do that job, to be someone in a position of power and say, I'm against this violence. So do you want someone in the Congress who will do that? Or do you want to criticize anything you can find wrong and then not vote for anyone? So he said, uh, otherwise the Congress or the problem would fill with Zionists. So he said, this guy was doing a great job, but people were finding something to criticize. The last thing I want to end with is APAC is powerful because the people in it are active. There are not 200 million Jews in America. The people who support APAC work with their money, they work with their time, they volunteer on phone banks, they send emails, they send flyers. They're active, they do stuff. When they say support a, a candidate, thousands of people work across the country to mobilize him. It's not because they have millions of people and it's not because they have a few billionaires because we have laws against, a one billionaire cannot give a candidate hundred million dollars, it's not how it works. A lot of middle class people have to donate. So the only reason they have power is because they are participating. There is no reason the rest of us can't do that. That was his main takeaway. So the two main action plans is A, all of us here spread this information. Dispel the myth that we shouldn't be involved, that uh, there's something wrong with voting for someone who's good for Muslims, that there's no point. It's on the responsibility of each and every one of us to start activating people. And the second one is to address this kind of apathy, uh, counter the arguments that we said before. Oh, but I heard this person said this and did that. Uh, uh, this is the main takeaways that each one of us can do in our families and our communities. Okay, so inshallah, we have about 15 minutes uh, before the Isha prayer. If anyone has any questions, you know, Sister Samya is a great resource. You can ask to either one of us. And alhamdulillah, we have Brother Jamil here as well, who runs the Prince George's County Muslim Council. I'm putting him on the stop spot. But if you have any questions to ask, feel free on whatever topic you want. We have 15 minutes. Thank you, Sister Samya. First of all, for organizing. Uh, the civic organization. Uh, we've talked to other massages about to hope this will be another lesson and we'll get more massages to do the same thing. You know, it's kind of like um, a bicycle hub and spokes, right? Spokes that reach out to all parts of the wheel and then, you know, with PGCMC, at least on the local level, not level being kind of a hub and masters being the spokes. So we all work together and not in money. Um, I want to back up something that you said, because I've read a lot of these things from the scholars over the years. Uh, matter of fact, um, Sheikh Tahir had sent me a number of the translations of them. And part of the point that is always made, and I've mentioned it before, um, is like they said, two people are running. When people say, should we be involved in that? Two people are running. One of them is going to win. You should support the one who's going to do the greatest good all the least harm to the Muslims. Because it's not like somebody saying, hey, you wanna go to the movies? And you say, well, there's no movie out that I wanna see, so I won't go. In the case of elected officials, you're going to get one. You're gonna get one whether you participate or not. So you might as well get the one that is gonna do the greatest good or the least harm for you. One of the other points he made, uh, which the Sheikh made at a function, Somebody said, well, how can we support them? If, and this was a time in 2012 when there were two referendums on the Maryland ballot, one on gay marriage, the other one on gambling. And somebody said, well, what if we support somebody who, or what if all the candidates support gay marriage and gambling? And Sheikh Tahir said, worse than that, they say Allah is one of the Trinity, which is the worst of sins. But still, <laughs> they're going to run and one of them is going to win. So support the one who does the greatest good and least harm. And the last thing I, I, I want to say, yes, you can vote your individual conscience, but politics is strategic. It's not emotional. So the way that we do things is that you want to take consultation and come together. When you, are, when you do not have the majority of the vote, then your vote needs to come together as a block. If everybody does their own thing, yes, you actually do die with it. If everybody just does their own thing. But if you can say, I've seen, you know, I had a run up, particularly on the state delegation, run some of the numbers. Uh, you know, in, in, in the state, you get one senator, you get three delegates. 
the, for the, the three with the top um, votes, the top three voting people are in, the fourth one and after that is out. Some of the four people, the ones who lost, lost by things like 19 votes and 25 votes. I would almost guarantee you that in any state district in Prince George's County, we probably have well more than uh, 20 eligible registered vote Muslims. And that would give you influence. And that would what makes the, di the difference. We have to build institutions. It's not enough for us to say, okay, this time I'll come out and vote or we're endorsing a candidate. We have to build institutions. He mentioned APAC. That is an institution. It's not just somebody looking at the candidates, it's their own ability to organize that helps make the difference. You need staff, you need people. Believe me, I've been lobbied by APAC. They have a ton of people. And then when I used to say no to them, they would activate their network and go right after my boss and say, Jamil said no. <laughs> then I'm getting phone calls from him. So we need to build and develop our institutions. When Brother Sammy was here giving an overview on Gaza, he said, for every $10 you give, nine should go to an advocacy organization. He said the aid will come, but we need people to advocate. So participate, join the organization, support them, so they can become stronger and you can see change. It's like, look up, it's lovely. I have a question for everybody. Is everybody in the room registered to vote? Everybody in the room was eligible. 16 and older, citizen of the United States. Are you registered to vote? I see some hands raised, I see some people just there. That's the, that's, that's the first thing. The next thing I would ask is go to PGCMC's website, pgcmc.org. Subscribe to the email so that we have your email so we can tell you what we're doing so you can help. Um, so I'm one of those registered voters that really haven't been voting lately. It was intentional. I thought I'd been doing what I needed to do, just researching the, the candidates that I actually presented. And obviously, um, the last person that I truly voted for was Obama, to be sincere. And of course, I think that was based on the like, emotional you know, aspect of it. Um, he was a black man, you didn't know who was of it. And of course, when he started going sideways, um, truly did a number on me personally. And because of that, I have a fear of actually voting now. Um, I would keep playing with subject matters over and over and over and over and over and at the end of the day, I wind up not voting. So, for somebody like me, <laughs> who is physically destroyed or within, really, uh, from a candidate that he's always going to do a lot more for our society and then turn into do something else, what would you suggest for me? Because I sincerely, I'm stuck. I'm really stuck. And I have been following. I've been going through the different sites, what's there are. I've been actually leaving the mainstream to go outside of that. I follow people like, um, not particularly in any in, in, in individual like I, I listen to Sputnik just to get another side of the story to make sense out of what's really happening. And the more I hear things, the more I get back deeper into where I was coming from in the first place and end up not going again. And this time I didn't even vote in the primaries or with the uh, uh the Monica, brother, can I can I answer your question? I, I actually completely understand your feeling and your sentiment. Um, I think many of us have gone through this at some point or another. Um, when we really invest in a politician and we believe that what they're telling us is inspiring and when they're in office, they fall short of that inspiration. And then what we're left with is a sense of, am I now accountable for what they're doing when they're harming our society or harming our communities? Um, first, I would say is give yourself grace. You don't control the actions they did. You're voting, when you vote, or any decision we make, we make with the facts we have at the time. You, did the, you made a choice between two candidates and you were presented with options and you could only make a decision based off what you knew about each candidate. There's no way for you to know what the future, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to do, what, what was going to happen in the future. So we're not accountable for the decisions any politician makes once they're in office. Regardless of whether you vote or not, you're paying taxes in this country. And therefore, we are all complicit in everything that happens in this country by way of our taxes. So the idea that voting somehow means that it's an endorsement of the action of every politician 
then would mean that every time we pay our taxes, we are literally doing everything that's wrong anyways. If you don't feel that way, then you shouldn't allow your vote to feel that way either. The one thing about Maryland is, if you are not comfortable voting for the presidential race, and as much as we want to have a voting block, and we should, and we should aim for that, if you personally are not comfortable just because you really feel disheartened, there are many down ballot politicians that are running in races that actually impact your community on a daily basis versus in the president. And so even if you can't make up your mind on how you feel about how to vote for the presidential, voting for your local, you know, your congressman, your senator, your local uh, city council, your mayor, your board of education, the people who are on that board, all of those matter 10 times more in your daily life than the presidential race a lot of times. I'm the kind of person who like four years ago pushed everyone I knew left and right to vote. <laughs> like you gotta vote. How can you not vote? You have to vote. And I struggle with that now because I'm like, oh my goodness, look what we're left with after I push so many people to vote. So I think it's a natural feeling to feel let down, but we have to remind ourselves that this was not in our hands. This is in Allah's hands. And at the end of the day, when we vote, even if we're not voting for a candidate, we are still speaking volumes by how we vote. So if you ended up in Maryland, which is a very safe state, I don't think anyone questions who's gonna win the general election for the state of Maryland. If you were to vote third party, even if it ends up being 2%, 3%, 4% or 5%, it still matters because I'm hoping you're gonna be voting for the down ballot votes where it's much more important, right? The, senator, uh, the Senate election is a much tighter race. The congressional election, all of that matters more in the state of Maryland. So I would, I would say that if you're unable to get yourself to vote for a candidate in one particular race, don't let that be the reason that stops you from voting in the other races that are even closer and more impactful in your local community. Uh, and when you do vote a certain way, in a, and the goal would be as a community, if we grow and we're able to vote as a voter block, then as they say, we have a seat at the table and we're more likely to have those conversations with politicians, that takes time. But you as an individual, if you're conflicted, don't let anyone bully you into voting for someone you're, you don't feel comfortable with. You should vote your conscience in the sense that you should feel comfortable going to bed at night knowing that you know I'm not, you know. And if you do decide to vote for a politician and he ends up or she ends up being terrible, again, you're not responsible for the actions of another human being. You voted because at this point in time, we were given two or three options. This is what we knew. And at that time, when you voted for pres uh, former President Obama, he was the best candidate based off a lot of metrics for uh, your community. And that's what you were thinking. And there was no way for you to know any different. And someone say that he, you know, there were good, the, if, since we don't know what the other side would do, you don't know if it would have been worse. So there's no way for us to know. Hopefully that helps. Terrific. Um, I think we have only two minutes. If there's a short question, we could take it. Otherwise, we'll adjourn. Okay. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi l'akhirati hasana wa qina adhaba anna. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu minat wa alameen. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Amen.